Another hard last name, Dan. Don't the Bros Bros okay. right. Head of Governance and Policy Center for Cybersecurity World Economic Forum. And then next we have Jay Healy, who is a senior research scholar at Columbia. CIPA, what does CIPA stand for? School of International And then finally, Jason Oxen, the CEO of the Electronic Transactions Association. So this week, somebody reminded me is the 15th anniversary of the Great Northeast Blackout. How many people remember that, what they were doing that day? Um, so the, my first question to the panel, which sort of sets the stage, is could a payment hack of some type, a hack into our payments ecosystem, become similarly a global financial crisis? And what would it take to do that? And uh, thinking about that, who would want to do that? Would it be a nation state? And how bad could it be, and are we doing anything about it? So we'll start with Jay. Oh, um, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you. Um, one on who might do that, right? A lot of the times so I came into this in, uh, from the threat intel side 20 years ago, and a lot of what we've always said was those with the intent lack the capability, those with the capability lack the intent, right? Yeah, the, the nations that might have the ability to take down the payment systems, they wouldn't want to. Um, but to me, that's always that's been accurate, but it's also a 1914 argument. Right, of saying that states have so much that um, at stake in this that they would never cross a line. Um, but the more that we, for example, take Russia or other country or Iran out of the U.S. dollar market of saying we can't work, then then they have less and less stake in global financial stability, and they might be willing to do such a thing. Um, with some of my colleagues at Columbia, uh, Catherine Rosen, who used to be Deputy Assistant Secretary of Treasury, and uh, Trish Mosser, who had been with New York Fed. We're doing a lot on cyber risk to financial stability. So we're looking at traditional financial uh, cyber risks. We're looking at the transmission mechanisms of how this cyber risk can then get translated into potential financial instability, um, like lack of IT substitutability. What do you do when an IT company that's too big to fail has a Lehman moment? You know, they're with everyone's data on Friday and gone on Monday. And then translating that into the traditional financial risk, the way that economists in New York Fed and the others does of saying, all right, if you now have the cyber risk that then leads to a loss of confidence or, or a lack of substitutability, how then, what's the pathway that that can then become a financial stability event? And so, of course, we can all imagine ways that that can happen. Very difficult, yes, but if the financial market is already in a, in a fragile state, as is often the case, then you can imagine that happening more, uh, uh, much more easily than the ones. So I'll take the question of, uh, could it happen, um, following on the question of, would it happen? And, and the short answer is, unlike the electrical grid, we're very lucky in the payments uh, system to have redundancies of networks and then redundancies within networks. So on the redundancies of networks, uh, we think of our payment systems as being interconnected because we know when we go into buy a cup of coffee at our local coffee shop, uh, there's just one terminal sitting on the, uh, on the desk there that uh, can accept any variety of cards or your watch or your phone or however you choose to pay, even though there is only one that you should be using. Um, and I'll leave it to Alex to talk about which one that should be. Um, so it seems as if there's uh, a single point of failure there. And, and indeed, at the uh, micro level, the, there is. That one terminal could be accidentally unplugged, and then you wouldn't be able to pay for your coffee there. 
But at the macro level, uh, again, redundancy of networks. The networks are, are actually uh, separately operated, separately uh, not interconnected with one another. Um, so that when your transaction leaves that coffee store, if you're paying with MasterCard, it's heading off in one direction. If you're paying with Visa or American Express or Discover, it's heading off in different directions to their respective uh, <laughs> operations centers. And so we have that redundancy of networks, uh, which makes it uh, largely impossible to bring everything down. Uh, and, then, and then there's redundancy within networks. That means that each of the networks operates redundant facilities. And if you've ever, how many of you have ever been to one of the card networks uh, operation centers? They are actually, you have to go in the trunk of the car with a bag over your head in order to get there. Um, but I've been to, I've been to one uh, fairly recently that's, uh, I'm, all I'm allowed to say is it's on the East Coast. Um, it is an absolutely amazing facility that, is, uh, that can withstand uh, literally tens of thousands of efforts to break into the network every uh, minute, uh, but also can withstand physical attacks, has redundancies of uh, utilities and the like. So the power of the redundancy of networks and the power of the redundancy within those networks means that if something goes wrong, um, that network operation can be shifted somewhere else. Uh, when you hear about uh, the very rare instances of a network having an outage, such as happened to um, uh, Visa in Europe um, not that long ago, or happened to MasterCard for a short period of time, those are not um, cybersecurity intrusions. Those are not efforts. The companies have disclosed enough information publicly so that you can feel comfortable that those were uh, not related to efforts to bring the ne networks down. Um, and, and indeed, uh, for the reasons I described, it would be very difficult uh, to do so. We're very lucky to have the redundancy. All right, great. Um, there's a company called The Clearinghouse. Is anybody here from The Clearinghouse? TCH for short? It's a very old company that's uh, been around since like 1860. It was founded to clear checks. <clears throat> and they still, uh, they've come into the modern age, they do ACH and a lot of other things. And they're owned by 30 or 40 banks. And they recently wrote a really interesting and rather scathing blog about regulation, which is the topic of this. They were arguing that bank regulations on cybersecurity are not a good idea because the bank examiners lack the expertise in it. And they impose suboptimal one-size-fits-all approaches. And the banks are spending 40% of their cybersecurity efforts complying with 43 useless regulations. And NIST, uh, which is federal government security, is recognized as state of the art, and they don't attempt to be as prescriptive as banking regulators. And they propose launching a private public initiative versus rulemaking to remove and remove obstacles to information sharing. It reminds me of what Alan was talking about. He said he wasn't trying to be real super prescriptive either. He was trying to do guidelines. So um, what do you guys think of this point of view? Anybody? Sure. Um, <laughs> broad question. Um, <laughs> but uh, specifically speaking, uh, not only with one of our regulators in the room, uh, separately from that, it's a joke. Um, uh, look, I think the abundance and proliferation of regulatory of regulations in the, on the cybersecurity space, both specific to the financial services sector, but more broadly, um, is not in and of itself a problem. Um, it's the excuse me, it's the duplication and the issues in which the deconfliction aspect that is being spent substantially more time by our companies trying to interpret things, which rather than actually doing the intent of public policy and regulations, which is to actually improve cybersecurity. And so um, I do think the private sector has a responsibility here also to recognize that we shouldn't um, pretend that when we use the word regulatory harmonization, some folks use that as to be coy and actually mean less regulation um, and to, to put it on the government as causing a problem in and of itself. I think that's unfair to both sides and not actually the intent um, gen genuinely of the sophisticated companies that are thinking about harmonization um, of actually raising the overall level both domestically and internationally. Um, so I actually think there's an opportunity there. I, I think the um, letter that was written is broad and hits at the right points, but um, I put more opportunity than outright problem. And, and here at Columbia last year, we put out a, a New York Cyber Task Force report where we said, what can we do that's going to give the defender the greatest advantage over attackers at the greatest scale and the least cost? Because if we're going to get ourselves out of this, that's what we have to do. We have to give the defender the advantage over the attacker and reverse this. And so what I liked about the Clearinghouse paper was that it was essentially saying, like, look, if you give us this compliance mechanism, 
compliance tends to be the opposite, right? It takes the banks or, or the defenders more time. They're spending so much time doing the compliance, they're not actually doing things that are going to stop the attackers. The compliance tends to lock in these old ideas, these old technologies, rather than things that might be more effective. It's negative leverage. Right. Um, and so we did a lot of saying, well, what, where have we gotten leverage in the past, in the past five decades of technology operations and policy? Um, where have we gotten the most leverage? And let's do more of that. Anybody else? I would add that I think it's a, a challenge to find the right balance from the government perspective. You know, there's a lot of organizations who are sophisticated, but there's also a lot who aren't going to do anything unless there's some sort of stick hanging over their head. I think we saw that in the privacy perspective with GDPR that nobody paid any attention until there was a twenty million dollar fine. Um, I think the challenge is too when you have states that put out these laws that say reasonable security, then everyone says that's a horrible law too because nobody knows what reasonable security is. And what we need more of is discussions like Jay is bringing up where we're smarter about how we're making policy as opposed to reactionary to the past incident or reactionary to whatever sells in public opinion. And I would just say, uh, as well, I mean, the, the call for public-private cooperation is absolutely vital, right? The World Economic Forum is the International Institution for Public-Private Cooperation, so you'd expect us to say that. But especially in this space, where a lot of the expertise resides on the private side, uh, it's not enough to just say, you know, regulators don't know what they're doing and just step out of it. It's more that we need to understand our responsibilities as a whole, so every stakeholder can step forward. <clears throat> if the regulators don't know what they're doing, it's your responsibility to help educate the regulators. And the regulators' responsibility is to come back and explain what the needs of their particular constituents are in this space and work together, not just industry and each country in their jurisdiction, but each industry thinking globally and then countries as well starting to think more international than they have in the past. That's great. Great nuanced um, discussion of the topic. So recently, John Bolton, he seems to be following TCH's advice. A couple months ago, he eliminated this role, the special assistant to the president and cyber coordinator, a role that had been in place for 20 years, because I guess we don't need that anymore. So why did he do that, uh, Jay? Is Vladimir Putin our new sort of cyber coordinator? Yeah. <laughs> 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 The, um, yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, so this position actually dates back to uh, Dick Clark, who was the first one that really kind of had this position. It goes back about 20 years. And most, or most of the recent studies um, that have come out have said, if anything, the position should be elevated from the special assistant to president to the assistant to president. Um, I can't think of any recent study, or any study ever, that said we should get rid of it and we should demote and demote that role. Um, so, it is, so it is too bad that we did that. We are seeing them, and that's the position that's there to say, all right, uh, the military and intelligence wants to go do this. It came out today with the news that, um, uh, that Dustin Bolt wrote, that's saying that, um, that this administration is going to roll back some of the restraints that have been on U.S. Cyber Command, and <coughs> a fewer operational restraints go, go take the fight to the enemy. Well, that, that might be really good, but who's going to be there for Treasury to say, all right, is that really going to be good? What if this blows back on us? How do we know this is going to succeed? Um, there's a process for that, but it kind of takes this person that has oomph, that has um, a direct line to someone that can go into the president and say, here's what we need to make sure that this isn't going to blow, blow back on us. And without that special, uh, that, without that coordinator, without a Homeland Security Advisor that has some oomph and a direct line to the president, that all becomes a lot tougher. Alex, before you joined MasterCard, I believe you had that similar job in the White House? Almost. One down. Okay. Well, uh, today. Maybe next time. Or uh, <laughs> if it <laughs> exists. <laughs> uh, uh, can you tell us about what that was like when you had that role? Same. If you can tell us, what, what um, can you tell us about payments related stuff you did in that role? Uh, sure. Uh, if you don't have to kill us. <laughs> we never did. Um, we did other things. Um, Ooh. Uh, much more effective. Ten pounds, ten pounds. Um, so, to that joke, um, I think in building off Jay's point, I think, look, um, not only was Michael Daniel, who was my boss, that prior position eliminated the, his boss and my former boss, Tom Bosser, who's a Monaco role, which reported directly to the president, also was eliminated. So, I just put a fine point on that piece. Um, and, and move from there. Um, to the second part, I think building off of Jay's point here, 
Um, that example on um, uh, forward operating and military and when having Treasury or State or others in the room, the benefit of that exercise and process um, is having adults in the room who push you to do better and think better about your own positions um, and challenge assumptions. Um, that's a pretty healthy thing in life. I'd encourage it again, um, particularly in one of the most complicated, both technological and also diplomatic spaces, um, cybersecurity. So, perfect example, um, the last <coughs> part of my role when I was the chief of staff uh, of that office uh, was developing the executive order, I wrote the executive order that created the cybersecurity sanctions regime. Uh, first time ever done. That process of thinking through and having Treasury, State, and others push us to, to understand what the actual impacts would be um, beyond the correctly desired leverage that I love Jay and the reports point or in the New York report on leverage, which is a perfect word for what we're trying to actually correctly move back in our favor versus the asymmetry that's been going on for far too long in this space, um, I think has to come back and uh, frankly, uh, right now it's on the private sector um, to do so. And that is both a challenge, but frankly, both from a um, decency and public policy standpoint, but in a self-interested economic standpoint, an okay thing um, that we should take advantage of in a positive way too. Anybody else have any comments on this? I mean, I think one of the surprising things, again, taking this back to the sort of international landscape, is a number of countries, especially developing economies, are looking at ways that they can develop their own, you know, cybersecurity strategy, their own digital strategy, and it's all, you know, highly centralized, and they're asking questions about, you know, where should this person report in? And most of the good examples have been, you know, a direct line to the prime minister, a direct line to the president, whoever it happens to be. Uh, and it's just interesting to see us go in uh, the United States rather go in the opposite direction in this space, um, which doesn't seem like best practice. And it's not clear why, they, why we're doing it. So, can, can I ask one yeah. question? So, so the U.S. has been very focused on, you know, the, the government's over here, the private sector's over here, and we'll kind of do some stuff in the middle. Yeah. Are you seeing more, but it's, but it's the private sector that has most of the agility and the, and the capability. Are you seeing countries that are tying those together a little bit more? You know, where, you know, when the, the president is going to be sitting in and make the decision, they're actually private sector around for the prime minister. They're more private sector people more directly involved in the decision making. Yeah, I think there, there are some, there are definitely some good examples in this space. I think um, Israel's a really good example. Um, we had uh, Benjamin Netanyahu come to our Davos meeting a few years ago and discuss exactly this. And in, in their estimation, even in emergency settings, um, it's very much a private sector led um, cyber doctrine. Um, because they understand that these people understand the networks better, they run the networks, it's important to have them in that space. Um, so yeah, so there are examples of where we don't have that separation as much because they recognize it as a potential national security issue. Um, Israel, for a lot of things, is sort of, sort of generous, so what works there may not work everywhere, but there is much closer collaboration in that space. I think Singapore is another really good example uh, where there's some kind of close collaboration this coming as well. Yeah. Okay, the Dutch team. <laughs> we talked earlier about the um, Bangladesh, it was nearly a billion dollars that somebody tried to steal. Um, Bangladesh did get some of it back, not half, I don't think, but... They lost about 80 million. What's that? They lost about 80 million. 80, okay. <laughs> and the FBI suspects that North Korea was behind it, and um, it caused Philippines to be blacklisted by the Financial Task Force. Financial Action Task Force for Insufficient AML because they were one of the drops of the pops in the middle. So, um, Rachel, um, do you think there's anything that could be done from a policy standpoint on something like this, or is the industry acting sufficiently on its own? I think, similar to my earlier comments um, and to other comments about public private collaboration, I, I do think it's important from a policy perspective for there to be some guidance and minimum standards. Um, one thing that I think is a real threat in this space right now is the rise of fintech and open banking. Fintech and open banking is great for consumers. They can get their data a lot faster. They can do more. They're not suffering from the monopolies of the big banks. Um, but the problem is that these are startup organizations that have no experience in protecting uh, privacy or cybersecurity. Um, and I think it's a, it's a real challenge where you have you know, PSD2 and government policy in Europe promoting um, as many organizations as possible coming to market 
if there isn't some sort of diligence or licensing requirement <coughs> around the security of these systems. Anybody else have a comment about that? Yeah, I would just note, I mean, there are 16,000 financial institutions uh, in the U.S. I don't know if banks have a monopoly, but, um, uh, you know, when you bring fintechs in uh, to the system, uh, if you will, uh, I think it's important to remember that there are different ways in which um, they come in. Uh, you know, a great example is mobile payments, which brings technology companies into the payments ecosystem uh, as a means of initiating a transaction. But if you're using, and most consumers don't recognize this, but if you're using your phone to pay instead of a plastic card, uh, it's much more secure than uh, any form of payment that's ever been deployed. Um, but there are technology companies involved, and consumers are, I think, not aware that the tokenization technology, the biometrics that go along with it, make it more secure than using a plastic card. And actually, the Federal Reserve surveys consumers about mobile payments every year, and each year, the number one reason it finds that consumers aren't using mobile payments is for that reason. They think, well, the technology is different, so it must not be as secure as when my bank sends me a card in the mail. Uh, so I do think we do have some work to do about education uh, for consumers. But I also uh, would suggest that the arrival of these new technology solutions uh, are not only empowering consumers to access financial services that wouldn't otherwise uh, do so. More people are around the world have a phone than have a bank account. Um, and uh, it also opens up new technology opportunities for everyone in the legacy ecosystem um, to uh, secure transactions better using those new technologies. The one point I can't was just making up, the most secure payment system is cash. We forget I, 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 I'm going to steal a $20 bill out of your uh, wallet and ask you if you'd rather have a $20 fraudulent charge show up on your uh, on your credit card statement or you'd rather have a $20 bill out of your wallet. <laughs> so you just made my point. <laughs> okay, well, as related to that, um, there have been so many data breaches. I think Equifax really pushed us over the edge. But, uh, so there's so many uh, pools of credit card numbers out there. And um, do you think there's anything from a policy standpoint that can be uh, done to address those kind of breaches? Or, you know, the industry obviously is acting on its own. There's different groups like the U.S. Payments Forum that I'm a member of that's looking at uh, collaboration among the whole ecosystem to solve um, security issues and fraud issues especially for e-commerce and uh, mobile payments. But um, anything else that, that the uh, government could be doing or the policies should be set? Yeah, I'm, I'm always hesitant to have the government uh, propose technology solutions. They usually pick the wrong one. Uh, the industry does it much better. And I think one thing that the industry is coalesced around, coalesced around and Deborah, you made reference to this, is getting card numbers out of the system. We've used card numbers for the last 40 or 50 years uh, as an identifier. Um, we don't need to do that anymore, and in fact, uh, if we get those card numbers out through the deployment of new technologies like tokenization that I mentioned before with mobile payments, uh, then there's nothing for uh, criminals to steal. Uh, we have moved in that direction uh, by deploying EMV here in the U.S., catching up to the rest of the world. Uh, we started deploying it 20 years ago. Um, that's a good, important step, getting static security codes out of the system. Uh, making it impossible for criminals to counterfeit cards, which was the number one source of fraud uh, in the U.S. Uh, as I think was alluded to earlier this morning, card fraud uh, in the U.S. is a fraction of a tenth of a percent of overall card volume. U.S. consumers uh, generated $7 trillion worth of uh, card transactions in the U.S. Uh, last year. About $6 billion of that was fraud. Um, so it's a, it's a very small number, but counterfeit card fraud remained uh, until two years ago, the number one source of fraud in the U.S. So we take those card numbers out of the system, we make it impossible for criminals to make uh, counterfeit cards up, and that really goes a long way toward addressing the, the, the number one source of fraud. So I, I would much rather see private sector solutions, like the move to tokenization, like the move to point-to-point -to -point encryption, um, new services that the card networks are rolling out to secure the transactions. Those are much more effective, I think, than a government What's technology. Number, what's number one now? Um, so uh, now the counterfeit is not number one, and as happened uh, in the rest of the world, criminals are moving on, uh, unfortunately not going out and getting jobs, um, so the fraud is, is moving online. It hasn't yet surpassed 
uh, <coughs> the card fraud for the simple reason that there are still a lot of merchants in the U.S. that haven't deployed EMV chip readers yet. So uh, criminals can still make use of those uh, those counterfeit cards of those merchants that it's haven't been upgraded. We'll get there quickly. Card not present. 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 And there's a point that came up just real quick in the conversation the other night. Incentives are a question because the parties, one of the biggest problems right now in electronic payments is that the industry, in order to get to the success that it has, has made consumers completely un, not caring about you know, zero liability. Consequently, any change in behavior that requires the consumer to do something, there's no incentive. And, and again, on, on the policy, because I don't, I don't think the government has to be technology, you know, has to push particular technologies. One of my favorite public policy things that we'd ever done was um, the SEC guidance of saying if you have something that's materially significant, we're not going to tell you what that is. That's up to the board of the directors to figure out. Then you should tell your investors. And I believe that recently that this, the, that the SEC made that mandatory. Um, I think that's the kind of that's where you get leverage, right? I mean, the original SEC guidance was six pages, 2,500 words, um, to just say here's what's going to happen. Did it have a big impact? Not yet, but it's getting there. Because now you can start saying, all right, Equifax, did they know, were they looking at this as a risk? Um, the, the, in, one of the institutions, of, uh, one of the associations of institutional investors brought suits um, against some of these companies, you know, the, the targets, the Equifax, and the others that were subject to this. Now you're starting to see this alignment of market forces, um, which I think is going to have a lot of power to it. It still doesn't have the mom momentum that I'd like, and I, I think you're going to start seeing that. Where CEOs, CISOs, CIOs are having your talk uh, are getting kicked out because of this. Board directors are now coming under scrutiny uh, and might lose their job and might come under uh, might come under short hair for lawsuit behind that. That's the kind of public policy that I that I, that I want. Um, where you're aligning these other factors. Oh, consumer reports. That public policy. I'm sorry. Is starting to. It's going to take a while. Is going to start rating cybersecurity risk when they're huh. rating a problem. Really? Yep. Think of how that is going to align. Think of how much legislation that would take to get a regulation to get right. But just imagine what that's going to align if they can get that right. Even half right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rachel, uh, that reminded me of something that you mentioned. I think it had to do with the California law. Mm -hmm. But how does a court ascertain if there's a lawsuit if security precautions were reasonable? <coughs> well, I wish I knew the answer to that because I would make a lot Definitely of my clients very really happy very rich. if I could tell them. But I, I think that's the biggest, when you're trying to look at where policy has been in terms of preventing data breaches, that is the biggest challenge that you know, the FTC has come out with this standard of we're going to go after you if you get breached and we're, whatever you were doing, we're going to argue that that's not reasonable security without actually saying what reasonable security is. Um, and a little bit of background for those of you who aren't aware of the new California law, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which goes into effect January 2020, has the first in the nation um, class act or private right of action for data breach in the event of uh, for data breach caused by security that wasn't reasonable. Um, and there is a statutory no damages required provision which has been the bar elsewhere to these class actions. Um, so if you are a company operating in California and you experience a data breach, you are going to get sued in a class action format. Um, I think it's $750 per person, but when you figure that most data breaches are a couple thousand or million people, those fines add up really quickly. Um, and there isn't guidance out there for companies and 12 late people on a jury are not well positioned to decide whether a company had reasonable security. Um, so I think that should put some pressure somewhere, maybe on industries, <coughs> to start coming out with self-certification methods and standards that they can come out in court and say, we participated in this in private public forum or in a private forum, we met this standard, you know, here's all the things that we did to protect ourselves. Does this have to be a California corporation or only a corporation of California citizens that respect it? There are, there's three different factors that make you subject to the California law. Um, one is based on revenue, 25 million or more, and you have personal information of California people. The one that's going to get everybody is if you collect personal information from more than, I think it's um, 50,000 devices from California, which you, you have a website, 
you are probably collecting information from more than 50,000 California devices. Um, and now I'm blanking on what the, oh, the third factor is being owned by a company with 25 million. And I would note, Deborah, that uh, at the federal level, really the discussion around data breach legislation has been about data breach notification. Yeah. Um, unifying a system where there are 50 different state laws that are applicable to data breach, uh, and those state laws vary uh, in what gives rise to a data breach notification requirement. One of the most controversial elements of the federal data breach notification legislation that's really prevented from moving forward is, uh, interestingly enough, when we talk about financial services, there's really only one class of entities that is subject to very severe restrictions <coughs> under federal law about data breach uh, data protection, and that is banks under Grand Leach Blood. Um, and the rest of the world really doesn't have those requirements. So there's actually, in pending legislation in Congress, been a discussion about, well, if we're going to preempt state data breach notification laws, we should really establish a floor at the federal level for uh, data breach uh, protection, uh, what kind of data protection is very basic stuff. And those companies, obviously, that aren't banks, that aren't subject to those requirements today, have opposed legislation that have imposed those uh, requirements at the federal level. We could have a long discussion about whether notification following a data breach does act the actual public good or just causes people to be alarmed in a lot of situations where they might not need to. So $150 worth of just to be notified. So, I mean, from the consumer perspective. There is, Rachel, there's no, there's no, in this California uh, regulation, there's no indicators or, or guidelines as to, you know, what the reasonable state of, of uh, preventive and you know, cyber security. There's nothing in the legislation. There is an old California Attorney General report where they outline the 13 principles of reasonable security. So there is speculation that compliance with those will give you some protection, but it's just speculation. This is a law that was debated for an entirely a week. Um, so there's very there's no legislative history to go off of in interpreting a lot of these provisions. Yeah, let's take questions from the audience. Yes. Yeah, so why is it so difficult for regulators to be more clear about it? I mean, a good example is HIPAA regulation, right? So anyone who's dealing with the patient data or is designing medical systems that deal with patient data basically needs to get certified HIPAA to be able to actually work at some, to some extent with that data. So it has been done before. Why is it so difficult to do it for, say, financial services? So is that trade-off between can you if you're trying to find what reasonable means, how long is that definition going going to last? Um, and uh, I mean, I think if you if you get a bunch of us together, we kind of agree. I mean, you, you're going to start with the top 20 control <coughs> or something like that. Um, uh, and uh, but it's this trade-off in the regulator space of the more prescriptive you are, the more you're locking your ends to, um, to to quickly being obsolete or or not talking about the most so, so let me take that a step further and, and build off your question on what Jay just said of the obsolescence element, but also I actually don't think it's that difficult. I think there is purposeful um, in part and not necessarily wrong um, in the way in which uh, it's uh, it overly prescriptive creates challenges in and of itself, um, both from a compliance standpoint, but more importantly, from again, raising that bar in cyber security. So what I want to come back to is Again, not only from uh, the data breach notification, which is inherently after the fact, um, and the comment and question you raised of why is it so difficult, perhaps we should be thinking about that upfront um, element. So something that uh, my CEO, uh, Maja Bangan, who was part of the Cyber Commission two years ago, and recommendations and something we're actively pursuing is a concept called reverse Miranda. Um, and it's a play on words of that. Uh, hopefully no one's been read uh, their Miranda rights, um, but we all know that from, we all on exactly, um, uh, right? What, what you say um, can and will be used against you. So take that and think about it in reverse. What we want to encourage is the ability uh, proactively for companies to come forward to their sector specific regulators, um, whether they're independent uh, agencies with enforcement authorities, or executive branch agencies that don't have direct enforcement action capabilities, Treasury, DHS, et cetera, and encourage an environment where companies come forward and bring out significant, substantively challenging issues they are dealing with in which there is an inherently governmental role that can further help address that issue together. To air those issues, so let me give a perfect example here from post 9-11 uh, experiences. Um, uh, in the chemical industry, and DHS, most 
further uh, getting itself uh, stood up, built out a concept called PCI up, um, which is a privilege, I forget what, something infrastructure. Um, and the point was to do a bit of this, and perfect example, Dow Chemical at one point came forward to the government and raised a significant set of issues that they saw potentially happen. Um, this is something that should all the more so be expanded into the cybersecurity space. It's in our interest, it's in fundamentally the government's interest of achieve, achieving that public policy end. Um, and frankly, it doesn't require legislation. Protected critical in infrastructure information. That's why Jay is here. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny because the one we are in with. To reverse uh, acronym, I'm back at it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, question here? Um, I have two questions. One, I'd like to ask Danielle, Alex, and Jay, what is being done on um, on the government level, especially policymakers internationally, to address cybersecurity? What specifically, what specific strategies have been taken in these other countries? And the other question is around education. I know uh, um, Alan mentioned they're educating banks in these countries, but what is being done to actually educate the people? Because I believe cybersecurity not only needs, you know, banks <coughs> and, and governments to play the role, but individuals too can play a big role in actually uh, making sure we're safe and making sure their work is safe or, or everything. So what is being done on an individual level to educate individuals around cybersecurity. Uh, yeah, why don't I take the? Um, I'll take the education one first. Um, the it's it's interesting. The there's a lot of awareness campaigns, and everyone really talks about the importance of awareness. Um, and some of those awareness programs um, have made a difference. Uh, but I would suspect very few of them. Um, where they tend to make the biggest difference is when it's inside a particular company where you're sending phishing emails and if people click on the phishing, you know, fake phishing email, people click on it and they've got to do education. Um, my wife went through, went through one of those and then she had to go through a video with Kevin Mitnick telling her how that's a bad thing to do. Um, so that is a punch And uh, so um, inside the the, uh, so, but most of those, like the DHS Stop Think Connect program, I mean, we don't have, I don't think it does any good because the pace of technological change, the pace of what the attackers does, it, it, it's just so much that, it, that it's really tough. Um, where it can really make a difference is when you're getting kids young and when you're teaching them about coding and you're teaching them where they can then, you're giving them the tools so that they're there to understand those changes as they happen. I like heard of you that were out at, at DEF CON and seeing the Roots Asylum Village where you've got these kids from eight on up that are learning how these technologies and how to do this so that they understand coding at the, at the younger ages. Um, that's the stuff that I, that I tend to like, but in general education awareness programs don't give the leverage that I talk about. We can, you gotta do it. You can't say we're not gonna educate the users and people. You have to do it, but you just can't expect that. I don't think that it's gonna make any significant difference, unfortunately, unless you have young. Yeah, but I would just quickly add that I think it's important not to insult the intelligence of, of end users, non-technical end users, which is not really how it beat. And a case in point to the SS7 multi-factor thing, right? So you're putting out a message that says multi-factor is, is good, right? Um, to the original point, I have my Apple device, I'm getting my multi-factor, but you're getting it over a text. And then you don't know, as a consumer, that you're exposed to SS7 attacks, right? And there are a whole bunch of apps which are readily available from Google and others where you can actually do multi-factor authentication through your smartphone in a more secure fashion. So I think there's this general trend of, well, the average end user doesn't know and they're not, they're, they're not interested, so let's just sort of gloss over the details. And I think people have a right to know. I, I, I think that's a great point, and thank you for caution, you know, for, for pushing back on me a little bit. The stuff that I really like, like um, Susan McGregor here at the journalism school, she teaches, it, she's the nerdiest amongst us, just about, because she's teaching journalists how to keep themselves safe on, you know, so they don't get arrested and their sources killed. You know, don't use uh, don't use email. Use text. Don't use email. Don't use text. Use signal. Right? I mean, right. that's the kind of, like the practical stuff. Totally. Use a password wallet. It really is safer. Use the um, the, the online you know the card uh, um, mobile payments. The, mo the mobile payments. Right? That's not user education or awareness. That's like do this. Right. So great, great. Thanks for the. <laughs>
Can I, can I record that? <laughs> yes, uh, so just two quick things. One, a slight pivot on the education point um, beyond the end user piece. So we also have a significant dearth in our skilled cybersecurity workforce. And being in an academic institution like this is a perfect point in time, I think, just to reflect on that aspect. So about in the US, the numbers are a bit all over the place, but a pretty accepted number is about uh, 300,000 open cybersecurity, broadly defined positions in the United States, both private sector and government. Government at about uh, 12 to 15,000 open, typically well-paying, high-paying positions. Um, and so what we've been trying to think about, um, there's a variety of other efforts um, in place, but why, why is it still not clicking, right? So something that we're um, pretty close to announcing, and I'm comfortable saying now, is that us and a group of quite large um, companies are, have come together with the government um, and are going to be announcing a cyber workforce initiative in which, in exchange for you going, pursuing a, in your undergrad degree, um, or an advanced degree on a cybersecurity technology related field, and serving two years in the federal government in a cybersecurity related role, followed by coming over to great companies like MasterCard and perhaps other companies that begin with our M um, and other sort of entities, um, we will cover the entirety of your student debt. Wow. In part. That is we the help first the news I've heard all day. Yeah. <laughs> it's a My students that are sitting on their dad are like, damn it. <laughs> so, actually, I'm a scholarship for service student. Yep. I just graduated. Um, and so I went to I went to the Naval Postgraduate School at Monterey. Yep. They're not the only university. You can, there's universities all around the country. They paid for my entire education and provided me with a stipend. And now I'm working for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. But I have colleagues that are at, or former people from my cohort who are at the NSA. They're at uh, the Navy Research Lab, so they're they're all over government. So I'm a big advocate yeah, for yeah. it, obviously. So uh, no, it's it's a double play on what it's exactly also you've done. Bipartisan support for that program. When we go to the job fair in DC, a bunch, bunch of different congressmen there. So scholarship for service. <laughs> We've got one in Florida, so if you're interested. And in New York. Just your, your earlier mention of the TCH paper, which kind of leans towards uh, against re regulation to Rachel's counterpoint of, of needing that stick. I mean, is there consideration that, you know, appropriate cyber defenses are cost ineffective for firms, which really actually pushes the need for more regulation for them to do so? Because if you think about the TCH, you mentioned that they're owned by banks. Would they not have an incentive then to lobby against forcing banks to use capital to, to have appropriate defenses when they are for profit? Well, that, that's exactly why they usually write their blogs that are anti-regulation. But I don't think that yeah. necessarily implies that the banks don't care about cybersecurity. Right. But do they care about it enough to, to, to make those expenditures in the face of, of returning capital to investors? Yeah, so uh, a couple of uh, quick responses on that. First of all, um, TCA, shortly after they wrote that paper, they went out of business. So they <laughs> <laughs> um, actually merged with another uh, group that now known as the Bank Policy Institute. Um, so, so much for TCH. But um, to answer the underlying question, uh, you know, financial liability for fraud falls on the banks. Mm -hmm. So they have a powerful incentive. Yeah, you know, as we talked about earlier, as, as David highlighted, uh, you know, consumers are insulated from fraud. So banks have a powerful interest in doing everything they can to prevent that liability falling on them. And in a lot of cases, these cybersecurity investments uh, are preventing the attacks on banks. Most of the big data breaches that you hear about are actually not of banks. They're certainly not of um, payment systems. And the way in which they get in are, you know, before um, Equifax, the biggest <laughs> breach that exposed tens of millions of card numbers uh, was Target. Um, and we all know the story of how that happened. They gave out network access credentials to their HVAC uh, contractor to monitor the temperature in the stores, but didn't wall off um, the, the payment systems from that and they were storing card numbers. So there are a lot of ways we can address that kind of thing, but I do think it's important to remember that banks have a very powerful incentive um, to make sure that they're not breached because they have financial liability when that does happen. Although I think there's a balance, and I don't think TCH brought that out in their paper, of, you know, I think of it kind of like Basel II, right? You've got two models, you know, but there's, there's a few banks that really can dive in, like the GCIFI, the Center Point Park Financial, that, that really do have these models and throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at it. But you still got over 10,000 institutions in the U.S., not counting up, up, you know, around the world, that can't do that, that don't have that, that are, that are relying on, on other areas.
and, and, I, and I wish the TCH paper might have called a little bit of attention, attention to that, because if Treasury were here, they'd say, that's nice, but what are we going to do for everyone else? You mentioned um, that there was a lot of resistance from the non-bank actors to cybersecurity regulations in Congress. I'm just wondering, and you said that uh, Consumer Reports is doing the cybersecurity scope. Is there any pressure coming from the fiduciaries, such as the administrator of CalPERS, the uh, New York oh, State controllers, on the part of shareholders pressing for this kind of disclosure and regulation? I, um, it, it's one of the things that uh, I used to say it tongue in cheek. I don't say it tongue in cheek anymore. If I could convince one person in the world to take this seriously, I'd get on a plane, I'd fly to Omaha. You get Warren Buffett to say, I will use the NIST cybersecurity framework in all my companies and I will not invest in any companies unless I know they take cybersecurity seriously and, and, and the instruction property hasn't walked out the door. And you can be on every business newspaper and every board director is, around the world is going to say, what the hell is the NIST cybersecurity framework? Then I keep flying on to Sacramento because DHS has the right idea. They say, well, we're going to talk to boards. And so they get on the plane and they go one board at a time. You convince CalPERS um, and the other activist shareholders to take this up at shareholder meetings and hold directors accountable. CalPERS, before Y2K, went to all of, their, all of the companies they invest in and say, tell us what you're doing on Y2K. Tom Napoli might be accessible on that for New York State. Great question. I'll take one more question and then it's time for lunch. I just want to quickly respond to Joe. There is a conference coming up here in October. And not the fall, like so yeah. over time for exactly that sort of large hedge fund uh, type of conference yeah. focusing on cybersecurity where hedge fund yeah. you know hedge fund hedge fund diligence around cyber as as a uh, as a you know, one you know, area of uh, those are the And there's a company called Cyber Hedge that's doing cybersecurity reports for asset managers. Wow. <laughs> well thank you so much and a great panel.